Okay, we're finally going to start talking about the pieces from this time period. And uh, before we get started on our first piece, I wanted to show you the different uh, tribes that we talked about. One of the things I said with the fall of the Roman Empire is various tribes had uh, pushed into uh, the what was the Roman Empire and finally kicked out the Romans. And what um, is left is a large map of different tribes or different groups that were for the most part a lot of them were nomadic so we're going to see a lot of the art from this time period is small and portable so that they can transport it because of their nomadic lifestyle um, so after the roman states departed britain at the beginning of the fifth century the angles and the saxons which we could see right here angli and saxony they are going to um, leave Germany and what's considered the low country. This area is called the low country because it's, um, you know, technically uh, at sea level or even below sea level, which is modern day Belgium and Holland. Uh, and then also the Jutes, which, um, which are around here, Jutes right there, that's modern day Denmark. And they're going to cross this sea and uh, they're going to occupy southeastern Britain, which includes the Thames River and the capital city, which was Londinium in run Roman times and will eventually be called London. Uh, and so this is where we get the term Anglo-Saxon. So people of the Anglo-Saxon descent are the ones that are going to um, stay in Britain, but originally have their ties to the Germanic peoples over here. Um, also over here you can see the Britons, uh, notice it went into um, uh, modern day Brittany in France. Uh, you can see where this is Francie, but it's going to be the, called the Franks. Uh, the Visigoths are going to be also in France. Um, and so you just see the different areas of the different tribes, so you get an idea of how the art moved. Um, there, one of the things that are hallmarks of Anglo-Saxon art is use of gold and red materials. So lots of gold, lots of red. And then there's also a lot of interest in filling every available space. So a little horror vacua is happening here too. Okay, so um, one of the pieces chosen for Anglo-Saxon art is this piece right here. And it's called the... It's pronounced, there's two, di two different ways that I've heard to pronounce it. Um, I've always heard it as Merovingian with a hard G, but I also have heard it said Merovingian. Uh, so however you want to say it will probably work. But Merovingian lo looped fibulae. And uh, this is on the, on the right hand images that you see here. It was jewelry of the Merovingian queen and where it was found on her body. So uh, when they found the Merovingian queen and they took an x-ray, you can see where these pieces were found on her actual body. Notice she's wearing lots of jewelry. That's where all these things are, different types of jewelry that is going to be buried with her. Um, beneath the Merovingian fibulae on the top is you could see the fibulae from a side angle and that's um, okay so this is the picture you guys have that you guys learned from but this one if I if you were to lay it flat you could see what it actually is and the function of this was to be a um, like a clasp for clothing that was inherited from the Romans actually this is how the Romans would uh, tie up their um, yogas. Did I say yoga? Oh my goodness. Their togas. Um, so the Merovingians were among the barbarian people who moved into Western Roman Empire, commonly known as the Franks. Their ruling dynasty, known as the Merovingians, is found after its founder, Merovich. So their leader in the late 5th century converted to Christianity and therefore connected his people to the larger Christian community that was forming at the time. Their art that we know is based largely around jewelry, 
which included brooches, earrings, necklaces, rings, bracelets, belts. And this has been found in the graves of both men and women, but the more ornate kind is primarily found in the graves of wealthy kings and queens and aristocrats. And so what this shows us is they're expressing their wealth uh, by bearing it with them in the afterlife. So these pieces tend to be created uh, by casting two separate pieces of metal, then refining them with tools and in laying them with precious stones and gems into the area provided. The inlaying of precious stones and semi-precious stones, that technique is known as cloisonne, which you can see in the term up in red on the screen. The fibulae themselves were made popular by the Romans who wore to attack attach their draped clothing and basically it consists of a pin and catch to lock it in place. Ornate fibulae became very popular in the early Middle Ages and are found in numerous barbarian grave sites and due to the lack of written information about barbarian culture the fibulae provide some of the most concrete cultural inf information we have about the barbarian tribes. Each tribe would have a unique fibulae that reflected their cultural traditions and art. So this particular piece is decorated in amethysts, which are purple stones, garnets, which are red, and then colored glass. And then um, we think it may have had pendants hanging from the bottom loops of each of the fibulae. So um, this is, you notice every available space is covered on this, on this piece. Um, another element to this is almost zoomorphic, so there is some ways that it can show maybe animals. It looks like maybe fish on the top. That's up to interpretation. And um, again, these are small portable objects because of the nomadic element of their um, the way that their lifestyle was. And then we're seeing a decline in the classical tradition as early as um, when these uh, were were made, which um, is in the mid sixth century, so these are the loop fibulae, silver gilt with semi precious stones, inlaid garnets, and other stones, and uh, this can be found in Paris today. Okay, and that's it for the uh, Merovingian art. The next one we'll talk about is Hiberno Saxon art.